This is Popping the Bubble with hosts Sandra Ponce de Leon and Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Cameron Schiller, co-founder of Farinim. Hi, I'm Fatma Kaplan, co-founder of Farinim. We are on Popping the Bubble. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for joining us here at IndieBio. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Well, you guys are doing some really cool stuff, and I got to see part of it in the lab the last time I was here, which involved some worms. Not worms. There, there's a different name for them. Nematodes, and I'm probably butchering every single one of those <laughs> words. But maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Okay, at Fernim, we use nematode pheromones to improve the effectiveness of insect nematodes for agricultural pest control. And pheromone nematodes are microscopic roundworms in this case. Okay, and so are they good or are they bad? These are the good guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These are beneficial organisms, just like ladybugs. They're used as biocontrol agents already, they're commercially available. And their efficacy, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But our, with our pheromone product, uh, they're going to be a lot more effective because our product will tell them they're very crowded, they don't have enough food, they need to go out and search for a new insect. So you're trying to use the natural system for the nematode and, and how it looks for food, and you're trying to sort of jump that and say, hey, there's food over here, you need to get over here, or there's no food here find some other food, basically? Yes. We are tapping into their natural communication system, which they use these small molecules to communicate with each other, either to find a mate or to tell each other, hey, come over here, there's good food. The one we work, it says, no food here. You need to go out and search a new insect. So how do you get that into them? How do you, how do you create that reaction in them? They... These compounds are uh, water-soluble, and nematodes are actually aquatic animals because they need water. If you put them in the water, if the water flows, they will flow with the water. And their communication uh, signals are also water-soluble. So we can put the nematodes in a suspension, add their communication signal, then uh, it will tell each other, okay, this area, we don't have enough food here. We need to go out and search. Then we can put them in the field, spray to a field. Now they're ready to search. And this is really replacing pesticides, so helping organic farming techniques then. They are used as organic uh, by a control agent, so it is going to make them more effective and also cost effective because when they when farmers put them in the field, they don't have to worry about whether it's going to work or not. It will work and they will control their pests. And if we can reduce the number of nematodes by making them effective, we can use actually and more farms because we are indirectly reducing the cost. Very cool. And so you said something that uh, about the nematodes that is unique, right? They are they mate with uh, oh, their mating patterns. That is earlier we were talking about the model nematode, Cineraptus elegans. Okay, the and model nematode. Okay. Yes, it is used for neurobiology. That is actually the first nematode I work with. Previously, I worked with plants. So where I identified mating pheromones, this was a very controversial uh, topic because uh, C. elegans does not need mating because they're hermaphrodite. But when they mate, they produce a lot more progeny, from 300 babies to 1,000 babies. Since they didn't need the mating, it was very controversial. Some scientists said they have mating pheromone. Some said, no, they don't. It's just a guess. So I was the first who identified C. elegans mating pheromone. We actually published that in Nature. It's one of the prestigious journals. <laughs> wow, very cool. Congratulations. So how did you come about um, doing this kind of work? Do you, did you garden when you were young? Did you, have a, did you live on a farm? How, how did you gain this interest? Oh, well, my background is a little different. I'm a small town girl and at the same time, big town girl. My grandfather had a farm. So I loved the farm in the summer. In the wintertime, I went to school in a big city in Turkey. It's called Istanbul. Mm -hmm. 
many of you might know. So I had a fellowship scholarship by the government to go to a boarding school. It was a historic school. So in the summer, I came back to grandfather's farm. So I was always with the plants and and I love nature and I really enjoyed fresh fruit and vegetables. I really enjoyed the farm life. So I was a lot more aware of it. And I also knew the pesticide use. And in the because farm- Because pesticides were used on the farm? My grandfather is a hazelnut uh, grower. And the farms, they used the pesticides because they had to. Without the pesticide, their yield was very low. He was very appreciative of the pesticide. But one of the things they didn't do is not around the house because we had honeybees. Mm. Pesticides, chemical pesticides, DDT, maybe uh, you may have heard about it. At that time, when I was a kid, they were using that. So if they... (laughs) A bit toxic. (laughs) Oh, it is really toxic. A recent article said, actually, when DDT was used and that generation, the babies that were born during that uh, time, now getting cancers, that was due to um, the DDT in their mother's blood, which I didn't really know. I thought, wow. So, but they never used DDT around the house or near the house, the farms, because it would kill honeybees. So I never saw the direct effect of it. But I also knew the farmers had to use the pesticides to have a good amount of food for the food security because they appreciate it. But now I know as a scientist, that was not the right way of doing the pesticide control. That's another reason I really like the biological control agents that without disturbing the environment and ecology. Cameron, when you were growing up, did you think to yourself, pheromones and nematodes? Absolutely never. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you get to this point? I mean, obviously you are passionate about about nematodes, but did you have a passion for farming or how did you get there? Well, I met this fascinating woman when I was in grad school, and she was doing all this cool stuff with plants, and eventually we got married. (laughs) What were you doing in grad school? I was working on healthcare research and patient satisfaction with care. And so you you came along for the ride because the uh, the view was nice and the company was better. That's part of it, yes. (laughs) How long have you guys been doing this? We've been working on this particular project for the last five years. When I was at the USDA, I knew um, it had a great potential. But one thing I learned after starting this project and many of the things we went through, it was really, really important for the scientists actually to pursue this project. And particularly when I wrote Small Business Innovation Grant, I realized how important for the scientists who developed and patented these projects, they should personally involve in this project to push it forward. When I was a scientist in academia and at the USDA, you just have a patent, you have this great idea, you have a patent, and somebody's going to develop it. You know, that is the impression I had, and it will help the society. But when I um, moved to the other side of the aisle, and I realized nobody can pursue this product and idea better than I am. And I am very grateful, actually, to business people to help us out a lot on the business aspect and guidance. First, to Florida Innovation Hub, where we started at the incubator and at IndieBio, and many of the advice they give us. It is really helping us out. That's great. What are some of the lessons that you've learned along the way and in, in being here in the Accelerator? What are some of the benefits that you've gotten out of that? The first thing is to be able to explain science to general audience. Like us? <laughs> yes, like, like everybody out there. And to say what we are doing in simple terms. Mm-hmm. That was a challenge. Well, it's already a challenge because you're working with nematodes and pheromones, and those are big words already to begin with. <laughs> and nobody knows what they are. Right. Our toughest problem is describing what a nematode is. Because we want to say nematode pheromones. Most people know what a pheromone is. They've got a general understanding. But nematode, people's eyes kind of glaze over when you say it. So we stop and we ask, have you ever heard of a nematode? 
When they say no, which is most of the time, we say a nematode is a small round worm. A small microscopic round worm that yes. you can't see with the naked eye. Yes. That lives on other worms. Uh, no, they, just some do, yes. Some <laughs> they do. live on just about everything. You might be surprised, actually, even the scientists who... Ha- Ha, who work in different areas do not know. And one of the most import, uh, interesting thing to me was it was one of the most abundant animal. I never knew I, until I started working with nematodes, one out of four animals was a nematode. I thought, wow, this is even more than the insects. Wow. I mean, so do nematodes live on us? There are some hookworms, intestinal worms. <laughs> These are just the awful ones. <laughs> <laughs> but the nematode we work are the good guys. They can't grow on us because temperature is limited, uh, limiting. Our body temperature is 37. These nematodes can't grow above 28. So they're good guys. <laughs> and Fama is speaking in degrees Celsius. So what's, what's 28 degrees Celsius converted into Fahrenheit? It's about 72. Look at you. 72. <laughs> okay, so you guys are developing pesticide approach and it works sometimes. You talk about the efficacy. Well, right now, yes. the nematodes are very effective when they manage to find an insect to, to infect. They kill it very quickly. They don't always find the insect. And that's partially because of the way that we harvest them and ship them. See, when the nematodes are in an insect and eating it up, they're producing pheromones that they use to communicate with each other. Eventually, the pheromones get to the right level where they all know that there's nothing left in there to eat and they need to change their change into a different life stage and leave to find a new host. When they do that, they go out and they find a new host. But when we use them as pest control, they are captured in water, rinsed off, packaged, put into a package, and mailed someplace. Then this whole process takes... Several days. Several days, up to a week. In that time, they forget that they need to go out and hunt something. So a lot of them, and even the longer they're out of the insect, the less active they are, they will just clump together with each other and hope that an insect comes by. If it doesn't, they don't infect anything. What we do is, right before they're applied to the field, we take the same signal and tell them, you really do need to go out and find something to eat. We remind them that they, they need to go out hunting. They were very hungry. <laughs> What's the lifespan of a nematode? It's actually about three days under normal conditions. They That's can when reproduce. they're inside the insect. Three days. And they cycle every three days and until the insect is completely consumed. Once the signal tells them their uh, food is very low, they turn into a specialized stage which has extra sheet on them that protects them from harsh environmental conditions. They close their mouth so they're they're not eating, and that is called infective juvenile stage. So it is the host seeking another name for it. And there are many names, but the most common one is infective juveniles. And, And how long would they be in the infected juvenile stage? They can stay for a long time because that particular stage has a different physiology. They have a lot of fat uh, stored, so they could actually last longer. Normally, it's three days, but in that particular stage, it could be months. Okay, so this is how the nematodes survive for shipping off to different locations. Okay, got it. And they can also survive out in the um, outside the host. It's a specialized stage. You guys are in the development process right now and eventually commercialization. What, what's that process look like? When are you guys going to be in market? We're hoping to be on the market as soon as possible. We have a USDA SBIR grant where we'll be doing some greenhouse trials with the USDA in a few months. Right now we are working really hard to scale up our production so we can provide them enough pheromones to do the tests they need to do. And are there different ones for different types of crops that are more... So, I mean, you've got not just one that you're developing, but a variety? Yes, there are actually several different types of nematodes, and they have uh, different uh, hosts. 
And actually, one of the good thing about nematodes, they target more than one insect, which is really great because you can protect uh, multiple crops depending on their host range. One of them is black vine weevil, so that's uh, for the vines. And the black vine weevil parasitizes grapevines. Very important for right, the... Right, that happened in Napa not that long ago, right? That's right. So they also have different strategies to find the insects too. Some of them are called cruisers they actually seek. And some of them called ambushers, they actually wait for a passing by insect and they jump on it. And some of them are intermediate and they kind of seek. If the insect passes by, they jump on it and they have different uh, strategies in between. But the major advantage is they have broad host range. And another um, good thing about them is they're safe for honeybees. So our pollinators are safe. They are safe for other biocontrol insects like ladybug. They don't attack ladybug, which is a very good thing. Other insects that they do attack are navel orange worms, which, believe it or not, uh, do damage to almond crop. And the plum cursulio, which also damages almond crops and any other stone fruit out there that they're growing. And they also actually attack fleas. Hmm. They're used for flea control for by consumers. <laughs> so is this something that is already in use for some of the wineries that are maybe have biodynamic processes in place or some of the farmers use the ones organic one definitely uses. Uh, the more education we have, the better we are. I was at a talk with master gardeners. I actually went to their education because I wanted to know more farmers in California. Since we are from Florida and I'm originally from Turkey, we didn't really know any farmers here. We came here a month ago and I thought I should know farmers and see what their needs are, uh, whether they know anything about the nematodes. And I talked to three master gardeners Two of them, they kind of knew about it. One of them got a sample, but she didn't really know what to do with it. And the gardener shop told her what to do, but keep it in the refrigerator because it's a biological organism. That's funny that you say that because I actually just started a plot, a garden plot, community garden just down the street from my house. So I have a, I have a few things that I've planted I wonder if the nematodes would help my garden, um, which has, right now we've got tomatoes and squash, cucumbers, basil, strawberries, a bunch of stuff. We can use a preventative approach. Should I get a little sample pack of nematodes? (laughs) Oh, we can definitely provide you that. (laughs) Because they're commercially used and environmental protection agency do not regulate insect nematodes because they're considered very safe. They don't consider them as biopesticides. How would you regulate nematodes anyhow? I mean, there's so many of them, right? There's a gazillion of them. <laughs> the- like, all you nematodes, pull over. <laughs> Get in my pouch. <laughs> that would be pretty good. But working with them are regulated. So when you guys are trying to develop your product and get it out there, and you're talking about like stone things like almonds and those kind of things, how do you get a nematode way up at the top of an orange tree or an apple tree, that kind of thing? You don't. You put it in the soil. The pests that nematodes are best at attacking are pests that have soil-dwelling life stages. And each of the pests that I've mentioned, the navial, navel orange worm, the plum corsulio, and the pecan root weevil all live have an underground stage and when they come up like to feed on the fruit the nematodes are too late so they need to be down in on the ground before they before the pests emerge when they get the get to the pests while they're emerging they can kill them pretty quickly and prevent any damage happening to the fruit but that's that's when they have to be as on the ground in the ground that was actually a very good question because I asked my partner, uh, USDA uh, partners, how do we control them? And they actually have traps and the larvae overwinters in the soil, then they crawl up the trees. So they have traps and the area that is sprayed is around the tree. So they would never go up to the tree. Yes, especially in the orch- orchards, 
farmers have sprayers that can just spray around the base of the tree. So they can apply the nematodes very, in a very targeted fashion to make sure that they get where they need to be. I love how much you guys love nematodes. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. I love it. It's so fun to watch you guys. It's too bad everybody can't see you guys' faces and gestures. You guys really are into this thing. So, okay, so pheromones and nematodes, same time on the ground, or do you apply the pheromone as needed? Or? We actually add the pheromones to the nematodes before they get put into the tank to be sprayed. And these things are very, very low uh, concentration and very hard to detect. So when you put them out on the field, the pheromones are diluted beyond anything. How big is your guys' team? Currently, we are two. I'm the CEO. And we also have a lab technician in Florida. Actually, two lab technicians in Florida because we just bought, bought a second one on. Well, so so you mentioned being married. How how is that working and and being married uh, and seeing each other twenty four seven? We find that we work very well together, and our abilities complement each other. I leave Fatma to do her thing in the lab, and I don't ask any questions about that. If she tells me to do something in the lab, I will. But the lab is is Fatma's domain. My job primarily is to make sure that everything runs smoothly in the background. I take care of the finances. I take care of whatever paperwork needs to be done. We, in, we do planning together. Yes. Anything business-related, uh, Cameron does. Anything science-related, I lead. But there are times, actually, his perspective is important. When I write sci uh, something scientifically and I said, can you go uh, through this writing? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. So with the writing, everyone is involved to make sure that it is clear and everyone can understand. Yes, it does help to have a person that isn't necessarily a scientist look over a paper before it gets published. Yeah, so who are you going to be marketing these to? Is it big industrial companies, big pesticide companies? Uh, who's your target customer? Our first target customer is greenhouse growers because, well, They've got a nice controlled environment that they, they're dealing with, but they still do have pests that get in. And we've got a pretty good idea of what kind of pests they've got. There's, so those are our first people, the people that want to grow things in the greenhouse that are organic, have minimal amounts of pesticides on them, or preferably none, and they want to control their pests biologically. These are the same people that are going and using ladybugs to get all the, the aphids that are eating their stuff up. Then we would like to expand to agricultural, industrial agriculture. That will require field tests. So that's why we start with the greenhouse. Pesticide, biopesticide companies are a good target too because our product complements their product, particularly the ones that sell nematode. We can improve their product's um, efficiency. And another good customer could be actually the ones they don't grow uh, nematodes, but they would like to be in nematode business, so they can be a good supplier too. For right. Well, companies. I think even just educationally wise on the consumer front, you hear a lot more of pesticides and the damage they do to bee colonies and the destruction yes. you've seen in bees. So it seems like there's going to be much higher demand for um, natural organic methods to farm. Absolutely. Let's yes, hope so. <laughs> How far are you guys from taking your product to market to really start to get a widespread I mean, out, of, out of beta phase? I really couldn't give a firm answer on that. We are... We've got a very good idea of how we're going to put this thing together, and we have a general uh, lab-to-market plan. As far as actually getting it on the market for consumers to, to buy, and by consumers I mean everyday households, we need to make sure all our uh, regulatory affairs are in order before we do that. And that's really the, our rate-limiting step. Once we can get that done and we can figure out how to scale our product, which is what we're working on here in Indie Bio, is scaling the product, then we should be able to get it out on the market within two years, one to two years. That's great. Is there anything that you guys are looking for or need to help you in terms of your goals and, and business objectives? Well, we certainly need salespeople. <laughs> Marketing and sales. Mm -hmm. 
And funding. <laughs> and, and funding. Yes. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Learned more about nematodes than I would ever thought I would know. Um, and very cool. I love the organic approach. Um, I try to buy organic and everything. Um, so uh, really great that you guys are doing this. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. This was a really great experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>